All right, good morning. How are you guys? Surprised you're all here in class and not sitting outside in the nice weather, uh, your mm -hmm. headphones in watching watching from right outside BFT. <laughs> now I've given you ideas, that's, that's not good. Um, no, I, I appreciate it. I hope you guys are finding the, uh, the chance to enjoy the weather. Um, and for anybody joining online, shame on you. <laughs> um, I, how'd you guys feel about flocculation? Do you feel like that was okay? I think there's some practice in the in the homework, so it, overall, I, I think um, hopefully it's not too bad. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a concept that was sort of present, but we kind of glanced over it. And in the homework, you could kind of see that maybe it would come up, but it didn't deal directly with that. And that is sequential reactors, or what happens if we do two reactors in series versus, let's say, the, that problem we worked last time with where we had two reactors where we simply split the flow, right? Something like that. So I wanted to, to kind of pick up there, talk about reactors in general in that context because, um, you know, we saw that problem where we had two flocculation chambers. That turned out to be pretty simple. You split the flow. You, it, it, since they were the same reactor was doing the same thing, same reaction, all of that, it didn't really matter too much. It was just you split it in half or I guess you could also pretend it was just one bigger reactor potentially. But so that that case was simple. It becomes a little more complicated if you have two reactors in series like this. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about that, how you would approach that in a way where perhaps if you if you had a lot of reactors in series, you know, how could you deal with that in some way that was reasonable? So if we have some concentration of something coming in, and I'll use N here, and some going out, one thing you could do is label them 0, 1, 2, 3, so on. So that would be kind of the first thing. So the, the effluent from this reactor 1 would be N1. If uh, we have N0 coming in, N1 is going out. That means N1 is going into the next one in this case. N2 would be going out of the second one and going into the third. And then we'd have N3 here. We could keep going and then have, you know, N at infinity or N at some, some number later, N of X. That's kind of, you know, the question is, well, how could we know what the final result is or something about the result along the way given a system like this? So that's the that's kind of the um, the problem here, and you'll notice in the homework that flocculation problem. Do you have you know if it asks you about how much flocculation is occurring in maybe the second basin or something like that, um, given certain conditions? Well, you could imagine it's going to be different in the first one. You have a different size particle, so that's going to affect the react the rate in the second one, and so on until the third one. Um, right now, what I want to do is take, you know, it, the flocculation case does become a little more complicated because that K changes, right? If you have K1 here and a different K here and a third K here, you can still handle it. It's not going to be super complicated, but as you'll see in a moment, it, it's pretty simple if you have the same size reactors, the same um, reaction happening all of that. So I wanted to take a look at that, see what kind of simplifications maybe we can make. Of course, we're going to have a flow here, and we assume that flow is going to stay the same throughout all, in this case. OK, so if I were to ask you to solve for N3, let's take a look how we might do that. Now the first thing you might think is, okay, well these are CSTRs, we see some reaction, um, and let's say it's a decay reaction. Let's say it's a first order decay. So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, well let's start writing up mass balances, see if I can solve 
the first one with some known stuff, then we have n1, and then I can solve the second one, put, putting in that first one into that value, and then we can go and solve the third one. Um, and that's that's a good approach. So that that would say, you know, you could solve for n naught over n1. And if you remember from our mass balance, if we said it's at steady state, let's assume steady state here. Then that would look something like this, right? Zero, uh, zero equals Q N naught minus Q N one plus the reaction term, which is a negative V K N. This will be N one. And then you could go on and solve, okay, let me formulate something for N one and then I can use that for the next one and so on. It would probably, you know, the first one would probably look like this one over one plus theta k, k one that is. And you could go on and solve the other pieces. Um, another thing you could do, if, if you notice that, let's say all the volumes are the same, and let's also say the rates are the same, so if that was your problem, then it becomes quite simple because you can actually say that really this equation applies to each of them because the theta is the same because this would be theta one. And so if they're all the same, then it's just one over one plus theta K, which is reasonable if you have the same reaction happening and nothing's affecting that reaction aside from the concentration you've got and you've just got the same size containers or reactors that could happen so maybe not in the flocculation sense but some other reaction certainly could be that way the other thing you can look at is really at the end of the day what you're interested in is not just probably n3 you're probably interested in looking at um, and i'm sorry i, I wrote this backwards n over n naught, right? So n1 over n naught. Um, what you're really looking for is that n3 compared to what you started with, right? How much has been removed? What fraction remains after three sequential reactors versus just going through one? That's kind of the question here. So rather than solve for n3 at the moment, if I phrase it this way and say I'm looking for n3 over n naught, you'll, you might notice based on how this is going to work, this is the same as asking, okay, well, N1 over N0 times the N2 over N1, that's that what happens, that fraction in the second reactor, times N3 over N2. That's essentially looking at, okay, well, what fraction remains in this one? Multiply that by the fraction remaining in this one times the fraction remaining in that last one, right? So that's going to give you, um, at, at the end of all that, that's going to give you the total ending fraction. And we can see that because the N2s will cancel, N1s will cancel, and we'll be just left with N3 over N0. Okay? So... That is a pretty handy way to simplify. And what that means is, if they're all the same like that, then this nx over n naught is gonna be simply equal to this one over one plus theta k to the x power. So if we had one reactor, it would just, that x would be one, and this holds true. We, we've derived that. If we had, if we're looking at nx where x is equal to two, then essentially what we're doing is we're saying that times one over one plus theta k, you know, if this was n two here, 
then it's just that twice, right? Because that's that's n1 over n0 times n2 over n1. So when I when I wrote all these out, n1 over n0, n2 over n1 times n3 over n2, even though the n's are canceling, effectively what we should be doing is multiplying that mass balance from the first one times the mass balance from the second one times the mass balance from the third one. Because we could write each of them in this form, right? We could we could write each of them out in that manner. So when we put them in, in a row like this, we should be taking that component here and writing it out in each one. And if the if the masses were not the same, we just write it this way, or it's not the masses, the uh, volumes and the rate constants were not the same, then we'd use this form. And yeah, we couldn't use the, we'd have to do like theta one, uh, K one, theta two, K two, if they were not the same, but it, it would work out that way. Um, if they're the same, so given these things, then nx over n naught, that's where we could say one plus theta k to the x power. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so the question for you, um, I don't really know how much sense this question makes. I wrote it out this morning, so we'll we'll work on it together and see what, what we can come up with. Um, essentially, what, what we have here, so we say consider a sequence of two eight cubic meter reactors, each with a bacterial growth reaction occurring. So that's a growth reaction, so giving us a little practice there, something different. Um, occurring within them with a rate constant of 0 0.001 per minute. If the flow rate through the reactor is 0.5 cubic meters per second, and the incoming bacterial concentration is 10,000 colony forming units per liter, what is the final concentration of bacteria if the, the first reactor is a CSTR and the second is a plug flow reactor? And then to follow up, will that change, will the final concentration be different if the order is reversed? Okay, so let's take a, a few minutes, see what you can do with that problem, see if we can uh, get a solution to it.
All right, so you guys see me going through and kind of deriving the mass balances that are going to be important here. We didn't do this directly for growth equations. I asked you guys to do that on your own time. Um, we went through the decay reactions. They're very similar. And so you see here, our for our CSDR, instead of being like n naught over 1 plus theta k, it's 1 minus theta k. Um, as our formulation for the growth, for a first order growth um, reaction in a steady state system. And for our plug flow reactor, for dealing with a batch reactor that stays in that plug flow for some amount of time, theta, then our equation there is going to be instead of e to the minus kt or k theta, it's going to be to the e to the k theta, right? That's from the derivation of, you know, if we were to write that out, that would be dn over n equals k dt. Integrate that, we end up with the natural log and so on, and we get, you know, we go that from, in this case, n1 to n2 from 0 to theta. That gets us here. Okay? So, these are the two equations, and we can still take a look at the uh, n1 over n naught times n2 over n1. And we'll find that, that that principle holds the same, and it doesn't matter if we reverse those, right? If if the same process is getting us that's getting us n1 over n naught, or the process that gets n2 over n1, they should be the same. Like whatever those processes are, should get us that same fraction. So to answer the kind of the second part of the question, in this case, it, it really should not matter. Does that make sense so far? All right, so then using those, what we would do, I'm going to erase this, make some space. Using those then, what we could do is simply solve for the actual number, or we could potentially solve for the fraction and go with that way, but I figured I might as well go ahead and solve for the actual number, so n1. Since we were given the n naught as 10,000 CFU per liter, I went ahead and did it in Excel. I'll show you my work. So for the first one, n1 over n naught, that's 1 over 1 minus theta k, or you could move the n naught over. First, I, I wanted to solve for theta, so that's going to be our hydraulic retention time. So for theta, that's V over Q. That's going to be that 8 cubic meters divided by 0.5 cubic meters per second. Like I said, I, I uh, drafted this question this morning, so I wasn't really thinking too hard about it or you know thoroughly about it. This gives us a hydraulic retention time of 16 seconds, which is pretty short. That would be something more like just a coagulation dosing, or you know, that's just a very, very short amount of time for the water to be in there. We'll say. Okay, but given that, um, and given the K, which was 0 0.001 per minute, well, we have to take that per minute and convert it to seconds or convert our flow, our retention time to seconds, or uh, to minutes, rather. So I just went ahead and converted the k into seconds. So k was 0 0.001 per minute. And so I said, OK, well, there's one minute per 60 seconds. That'll cancel out the minutes and give us a new k. in per seconds. 
once we did those two conversions or uh, calculations, we were pretty much set to go. And so then in our first calculation here, we started with 10,000 and we grew two more bacteria, <laughs> according to that, right? So it was not a, not a huge difference there. Um, But it makes sense because there was really not much time for them to grow. Yeah. It's a good question. Do you have to convert the CFU per liter into cubic meters? Uh, it turns out you don't because the, um, the concentration unit here is not directly interfacing with the, the other units, right? So it's we have the concentration and it's growing at some rate so if we take a look, let's say, at our equation here, following the units, what we're trying to solve for is something in CFU per liter. Um, and so on the left side, we have CFU per liter. On the right side, we have CFU per liter divided by something. And that something is 1, which is unitless, minus something else. So that something else has to be unitless. So that's theta times k. That k is in per per seconds, because we converted it, and the theta is in seconds, so those two cancel. And so what we end with is just CFU per liter to CFU per liter. Now, if we wanted a ratio, we could do N1 over N0, but that just means both sides are unitless, because whatever units we have here, they're going to be the same. And so we could convert it, but we don't have to, right? Because it's not going to change you know, there's, there's no other pieces that are connecting with it. Like, these two connect and have to cancel each other's units um, in this problem. So a lot of times when we're solving for a concentration like that, that's going to end up being the case. Good to, good to watch for it, but in this case, you don't have to change the units. All right. So that was N2, or N1. Now, N2, we know, is going to be equal to that N1 times E to the K times theta. So that's fairly simple. We already have K and theta now because they're the same reaction, same, same uh, size reactor, even though it's a different shape. And so we just put in those numbers here, and we get a another increase of three more bacteria, essentially. Okay. So those are our, that would be our final answer then. Um, here. And then we can compare to quantitatively answer the the last question or prove it to ourselves, we can kind of just do the same process in reverse. But as we know from this principle here, we do expect that it's going to be the same, right? We, we expect that there's not really going to be a difference. So let me just take a, a quick show of that. I put in the calculations here for N1 instead of using the plug flow, uh, the CSTR, I use the plug flow. So I used um, E, so I, I took uh, N naught times E to the K theta. That gave us um, an N, N1 of, again, a little bit about, just about two bacteria more. And an N2 doing the reverse gives us the same final answer. Now. What I'm not saying here is the reactions occur in the same way in the two systems. Um, it might kind of look like that, and that's sort of my bad on the design here of the problem. Um, what we will see if we change the situation, maybe we'll increase the theta quite a bit. Um, we should see, a, like the plug flow reactor and the CSTR, they do operate differently in terms of how much growth you can expect. Okay, so let's take a moment and compare 
Let me go ahead and expand this a little. Let's compare this number to N1 for, this is the plug flow first, we'll say PFR, versus the CSDR here. And just take a look at what happens if we change some parameters. So if instead of 16 seconds, we had a much larger volume, and let's say we had, I don't know, 1,600 seconds, we start to see a difference here. Uh, we could also bump up the rate maybe. Well, maybe that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> I don't know what, what I just did there, but okay. Well, so let's, um, let's just manipulate the, uh, the theta. So if we had 16,000 seconds for each of them, then in our CSDR, we have, let's see, 13,636 versus the plug flow reactors, 13,000 there. If we were to change our starting conditions, let's just say 1,000 here. Kind of have the same ratio there. And I broke it. So that's interesting. I have no idea why that would go negative. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop uh, messing with that because I'm not sure what's what I'm doing and it's confusing me a little bit. <laughs> that shouldn't we shouldn't end up with a negative number. You see over here we get a massive number for the plug flow reactor. Would have expected a large number there too. But. Okay, at any rate. Um, one of the things I was hoping to illustrate here was reactions in a plug flow reactor do tend to be more efficient in a manner because instead of mixing with the entire system, so whatever you're coming, whatever's coming in and mixing, that you immediately dilute it. So if you've got a first or second order reaction happening, then the amount that you have to work with is immediately reduced, or I guess in the growth case, immediately increased. So that changes things compared to, so let's imagine for a moment a decay reaction, and it's decaying 10% over time. If you immediately dilute it from 100 down to 50, and you're reducing it by 10% over time, then the first minute, let's say, you're gonna have a removal of five if it's 10% per minute, right? So if you started with 100 and it dilutes to 50, so let's say N1 was 50, then 10% of 50 is five, you're gonna remove five in the first minute. And that'll actually happen continually. So you're always removing five because you're always, you reach steady state, anything that enters is gonna reduce by five. If you have a plug flow reactor, that first minute, you started with 100. Again, if we're, if we're comparing just the same, the same plug flow reactor versus the same CSTR, then the first minute you're reducing by 10, right? So you get a bigger drop for over time because you started with that higher amount. So there is a reason to change what you're using. This problem did not illustrate that very well, but it did show you something about manipulating two two reactors in, in sequence and give you a little practice there. So I'm not so happy with that part of it. I wanted to show something else in addition, but we'll we'll maybe come back to that later. Overall, does that make some sense in terms of the uh, using these reactions reactors in series? Okay with growth reactions. All right, excellent. Okay, so I want to talk about filtration now and it's a uh, relatively straightforward so I I think we still have enough time even though we spent a lot of time on that reactor reactors in sequence so there's two types of filtration we'll cover um, and there are typically used one would be membrane and the other would be granular so we're going to cover granular filtration 
now and for the first exam. I actually don't remember if I gave you homework problems on it, but we'll, we'll definitely do some practice problems next class on granular filtration. It's a relatively straightforward process. The concept here is you've got um, some water and then a bed of sand or granular media. And so this would, this would be just like essentially lots of grains throughout this system here making, making your filter bed. You can think of it like a Brita filter. So in this case, color code it. If we have water on top here and water is being added to the top, that water will flow through and out and it's going to be fed by the gravity in some sense. So we, we put our pipe such that it's gonna fill up this tank and then we let gravity push through the water through the sand type media. It's usually gonna be a, a very carefully controlled sand plus perhaps activated carbon or anthracite or something to that effect. That's different than our membrane filtration, which we have, you know, some particle gets physically blocked as it's trying to go through, as water is going through, that particle gets stuck on the surface um, and is rejected by size exclusion. Uh, the process in granular filtration, certainly size exclusion can happen, but that's not actually what we're relying on. There's actually a lot of adsorption. So it's giving the particles time to stick to the sand particles and it's you have impaction where the particles are like sedimenting and hit and drop and sediment onto the, the grains as it's flowing through. Um, again, a good example for the granular filter would be like a Brita filter. Um, even a, like if you're pouring water through coffee grounds, you might think that's reverse filtration where you're taking stuff, you're desorbing the coffee molecules, but the water is still filtering through that granular media, right? So that's the granular media concept Whereas then the, the coffee filter itself would be that size exclusion, okay? So during the granular filtration, I mentioned you can have mechanical screening where the particle sticks, you know, and is rejected by sitting on top, just sitting there. That's not the primary because most particles that we're interested in are gonna be smaller. If they could, sit on there, they were probably sedimented out from our sedimentation. So sure it'll happen, but most of what we're looking through for is this fine tuned sedimentation where you have just this network of channels that give spaces where particles can just settle a few millimeters and then reach a particle and then they're, and they're gone. Especially if we've destabilized them with coagulation, right? If they're destabilized particles, they're gonna tend to stick to these sand grains. And you can, you can design and have maybe sand grains and then some other type of grains like a two layers. And then the particles have two different chances, two different types of surfaces to interact with and, and be removed. Given that you destabilize them, maybe the particles themselves stick to other particles and flocculate during the process, during their travels. They have a long way to go, more than just like the one or two meters of sand because they're gonna be traveling through those pores going to be a kind of a tortuous travel distance or path, there's a good chance they'll meet each other and flocculate form larger particles and get stuck that way inside. Uh, they might get, you know, might go through what's called interception where the particles are gliding on by and they, they just kind of hit the edge of one of the particles and get stuck to it. Um, or impaction if the particle is you know, flowing with the water and then the water changes directions, the particle doesn't quite change direction as fast and then it impacts the sand grain and gets stuck. The point really is we want them to touch the sand grain somehow and it's gonna likely, since we've destabilized them, it's gonna likely end up in separation. So it's, it's cheaper in some sense than membrane filtration because we don't have to have the pressure associated with pushing the water through dealing with fouling, all of that stuff. It's like, it, it's again, using gravity in some sense and using a, a simple, um, simple strategy to get that separation. So 
couple little examples here. Um, there was a, a donation by Hungerford and Terry to our department, this uh, three columns, each with um, a combination of this green sand plus stuff and uh, anthracite. So this is in my lab. And if you're interested in coming to check it out, we can arrange that. I'll have a little uh, poll for that in a minute. Um, but essentially, it's, it's a neat device. We don't use it for much aside from just demonstrations because uh, we don't really have a, a research purpose for it in mind at the moment. Um, but it's a nice setup. We could take samples before and after the filtration. This is um, slightly pressurized more than just gravity. So right now we, we have it hooked up to the tap. So the tap water pressure would pressurize the water to go through. And then the water would, would be pushed through these pipes and then through the filtration and then would come out as treated water, okay? Um, this is specifically geared towards removal of um, iron and arsenic. That's partly the media that's in there. Um, so granular filtration is used for more than just the, the particle removal. In terms of iron and arsenic removal, what you typically will do is try to oxidize it and then precipitate iron arsenic type solids and then remove those and remove whatever other dissolved stuff you can through something like granular filtration. So it's similar concept, similar process. There's another picture of some granular filtration units or what might be them um, uh, here from some sort of treatment plant. Okay, so just a, an idea here of what granular filtration looks like in practice. Again, it's some sort of coarse granular media. And to load, like what, in practice, a filtration bed, typically, if it's not one of those column type things, it's not a uh, column-based pressurized system, so both, both of these cases would be pressurized, then what we're going to use is gravity. And you see this guy in here. They're loading probably with a crane, this like cubic meter of, of media here. So they're assembling this bed, and that guy in here gives some perspective. These beds are often, you know, maybe eight meters wide, 20 meters long, something like that, large space. And then it's going to be a, probably a couple meters of media. So it's quite a, quite a lot of sand um, or other media. It's another picture. We've got a couple basins here. I think, I think these are going are shaped like this. And each of these would be filled with the media. They're loaded right now, so water's filtering through them, and eventually they'll be drained and backwashed. I think I've got some videos to pull up to kind of show you this a little more um, in action. It's kind of neat to, to see. Uh, before we get there, though, um, a couple of, couple of notes. Um, history of granular filtration one of the first things we used for water treatment. You know, people recognized the ground, groundwater does some decent job um, filtering water. So it was kind of one of the first, first thoughts. In the 1800s, it was also used in some sense as a biological filter. So a slow sand filter, let biological action take, um, take action um, and treat water kind of on the slower scale, you can treat wastewater that way. Um, I guess if you're treating drinking water, hopefully there's not too much biology, but it's gonna happen if you've got the slow system. So the slow system meaning it's just very kind of slow draining through it. You're not pumping, you're not necessarily backwashing all that. So there's a few terms we'll need to know as we discuss the filters. First of all would be the ripening. So if we are doing our sand filtration or sometimes we call it rapid rapid sand filtration as opposed to the the old slow version that ripening step it's like the first few minutes after installing a new brita filter you get some black specks particles out you don't want to drink those presumably they're harmless should be just activated carbon but it still looks gross for a, a sand filter you want to operate for maybe 15 minutes to let the sand grains kind of settle into place, um, essentially priming them with maybe a first layer of a few particles, flushing out any of the 
the particles from the previous filtration time that got unsettled during the backwash but didn't make it out in the backwash, you want to get those out of your system, whatever's going to come out in those first few minutes. So that's called a ripening. That's water that is wasted in the sense that we're not going to drink that water, right? That's going either back to the front of the treatment train or processed as wastewater elsewhere. Backwashing is pretty obvious. We'll typically reverse the flow. A lot of times we'll do an air purge, so push air through the media. It, that helps to kind of break them up and um, agitate the particles. Because what we want to do is take all those particles that got stuck there and then just flush them out backwards, treat that as wastewater, and then be able to resume, right? So ideally, all these particles that are collecting, we can replenish our system and make it usable again without exchanging any media. What we want is to have just clean the stuff and use it again. That's, that's the goal. So we're regenerating our filter that way. Next term is head loss. That's gonna be a reduction in pressure or head, as you might call it, across the filter. So if you've got a, a filter and some water over time as it's getting all fouled up, then you're gonna require a little bit more pressure. And what that's gonna look like typically is you're just adding more water and it gets higher and higher, the water level required to push water through. So there's gonna be some physical limits here. You don't wanna to get too high pressure. Otherwise you're probably gonna start channeling the sand. It'll kind of create open channels. Water will flow through too quickly, not get filtered. Maybe you're gonna push some contaminants out the other end. Um, bad things will happen. So we don't want to overpressurize it. We have some safe operating range that um, eventually we just need to clean it, right? So that would be the, the head loss. And we can kind of observe that by how high the water is stacking on top of the filter to push it through. Last one is turbidity. I'm sure you've heard of this before. This is a uh, common metric of how many particles are in the water. It's light scattered by particles. Um, and this is going to be a good a good way to measure the filter performance. In fact, if you if you remember the the reading assignment, which we'll we'll uh, talk a little bit more about probably next time, and maybe have the quiz on finally. Um, that cryptosporidium outbreak in Milwaukee. One of the thing one of the issues was to do with turbidity monitoring. So, if you um, if you haven't, definitely go go back and look through that take a look at what kind of uh, issues the system had with its monitoring uh, capabilities. So just a picture of turbidity here. This is, it doesn't really matter what color it is. Um, it's that the fact that it's cloudy and you can't, the light's not passing through it. And it's not because the light's being absorbed, it's because the light's being scattered. So that's different than looking through a glass of tea. You know, if you have a nice clear, glass of iced tea, you should be able to see mostly through it, at least most colors, but some of the colors will be blocked or will be absorbed. So it's the light's passing through it unobstructed, um, but but it's, it's stained. So the turbidity is different. This is just, you could have white particles causing scattering and you can see very far through it, like milk, for example. So a way to measure this, um, if you're doing like a field sample, you use these little shecky discs or however you call it and basically you're measuring how far can you distinguish the the two colors and at some distance you mark it say okay well the visibility is this number of feet through that's going to correspond to some turbidity met metric the NTUs nephilometric turbidity units um, as we see NTUs here that's a common one There's other ways you could describe it I'm not too worried about that specifically. It's it's just a, a measure of how far you can clearly see through the water, right? And that's an estimation of what's the particle content. Okay, so we're gonna use that as one of our criteria for understanding when do we have to backwash? Because one of the, the key challenges for designing a water treatment plant is going to be how often do we have to backwash and how much water do we have to use while we backwash, because that's gonna tell us something about, okay, how much net water do we get per filter? 
and how many filters do we have to have if we have to wash them every other day? Because we can't just turn them all off and then the, our city gets no water for an hour while we wash them. We have to cycle them carefully, make sure we have backups for maintenance and so that we can take two off at a time to do maintenance on them and the other six are working, something like that. So a lot of our design of granular filtration is really just a water balance, how much water are we spending on backwashing? How much time are we spending on backwashing? How does that all fit into our design and to achieve our delivery goals of how much water we're providing? Okay, so in order to decide when to backwash a filter, there's really three things we could use. Usually they're in combination. The first would be a head loss limit. If we get over some pressure, that would mean, okay, the pressure is getting too high, we have to backwash because our, our media is not gonna be able to handle any more pressure and safely and we're worried we could have a, um, a contamination event, right? So this would simply be a pressure limit. And you could observe that by the height of the water. If you're using a, a rapid sand filter like a grant, a, um, you're loading like like the ones we just saw you could have a time limit maybe your water is pretty consistent you kind of know exactly how long it's going to take until the pressure is getting bad and until maybe we typically start seeing turbidity come through after a certain amount of time and so you could maybe have some arbitrary time limit based on experience um, or or just simply say okay well we're going to cut it off earlier if we need to, or at least by this time, if not sooner, right? That maybe it's a time limit in that manner. So a uh, turbidity limit then would be, um, okay, if the turbidity gets to X amount, so let's say if we started backwashing here, or started our process, and the turbidity looks pretty good, and then it starts hitting a, a climb, well, maybe we want to cut it off at this limit because we know that's kind of the limit we can safely treat for the disinfection step. The disinfection is going to be um, hampered by particles in the water. So in order to get effective in disinfection, we need a certain turbidity threshold. If we need the water to be lower than that. So maybe we have identified some turbidity that's acceptable and we say, okay, well, maybe with a, a bit of a safety factor, we're going to cut it off if we ever get to this point. So particles are starting to make their way through. We'll stop the cycle then and declare that our, our backwash. So when we talk about a cycle time, what we're talking about is that, that we start it and there's usually gonna be a few minutes of, um, of ripening I'll draw it out, a better diagram out in a moment. We'll have that ripening, then we'll have production of water up until we can't produce anymore. We hit a time limit, we hit the turbidity limit, something like that. Then we backwash and go through the cycle again, okay? So head loss limit, we're looking at um, a head loss. If we have some limiting factor there, we'll probably start with a little bit of pressure required just based on the pressure required to push it through the sand. And then this should probably be a kind of a linear increase over time. And then when we hit that, that threshold, we would backwash that. Okay, time limit's pretty obvious. So the full cycle, what it's gonna look like, just you know, the, the cycle timeline, I would typically denote it this way. We have the first stage as ripening, and actually what I'll do is I'll write it here. This is probably something like 15 minutes, typically. Then we have production. So we have production for um, the bulk of the time. So we're producing clean water here. This is being going to be used downstream. And then eventually we have to terminate the, 
the production and backwash. And a lot of times we'll also have an air purge here. Um, maybe we would do that kind of just before the backwash. Sometimes you might just call it part of it. So let's say the air purge might be five minutes, and then the backwash maybe 20 minutes. These are sort of arbitrary, but I'm just giving you a feel for what a typical operation might be, right? So the production might be something like 72 hours. So even though we are wasting water in the first 15 minutes, and again, wasting water, really creating wastewater, taking cleaned water and pushing it back backwards through with 72 hours total that pays for itself pretty quick and then you have a long time of production right maybe it's 24 hours and the rates are a little higher or something but essentially we have these components of any given um, filtration granular filtration system okay i want to and i think we will do a little bit of this now this uh calculation but I want to show you this video hopefully yeah. sorry about the, uh, the noise here hang on So here's a, a video of a, a filter that's beginning to be backwashed. And actually, they're starting with an air purge. So you can see uh, all that wonderful looking water there. Let's see if I can turn off one of the lights for you here. Okay, so that's the, uh, the air purge. We can see it's a delightful amount of particles and junk in our presumably clean drinking water to be, right? <laughs> um, so that boosts of confidence, right? Um, one thing to consider here is this is probably hours and hours and hours of filtration. Having added coagulant, which often adds stuff that's going to become particles themselves. So our coagulants that we add um, sometimes we'll add things that are designed to precipitate to aluminum solids and stuff. So some of this is just junk that's in there because we added it. But a lot of it's junk that was in the water that we're treating, right? So it's a pretty impressive amount of stuff. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit through here. Um, Okay, so this is the, uh, the worst part. I'm just gonna go ahead and mute that all the way. So that's that's the air purge. It's, uh, as you can see, all those people, I, I could do a full blast for you, but then you'll all hate me. So um, once they, they purge the air out of the system, um, then they're essentially ready to uh, prime the pumps and start pumping water back through if the uh, noise is done. Nope, not quite, not maybe. So they're still priming the pump, getting, uh, getting it filled with water.
Okay, so somebody you just heard said uh, this is how they make root beer. So they're going to start they're starting to push water through and they fast forward a little bit. And here's that root beer that we're talking about. <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty delicious looking, right? So, so this is uh, two filtration beds, by the way, and they have these troughs in each of them for adding water or taking water away. They send it through this one big trough between. So what you can see here then is essentially they're set up in this sense to take away, um, take down two filtration beds at one time uh, to do the bath washing and maintenance on these two beds. So they probably have these set up, you know, multiple sets of beds like this. So this is them taking all, all that wastewater out for treatment separately. So you can see the scale here is it's kind of impressive. You know, it's, it's one thing to say, oh, 15 minutes of backwash, but there's a lot going on in there. Okay, there's some other good ones. Um, I often find this one on the, uh, we're just gonna skip through real quick. It's a different bed, different design. Um, and the, the, the junk in the water is a little bit of different color as well. So that's kind of interesting. So they're, they're doing the backwash. Fast forward. Actually, I think this one has a pretty good view right as it starts. It's kind of neat. You can kind of see the, uh, the little plumes of dirt start coming up right as the, the backwash begins. And it's kind of a neat uh, transformation there. Really see all the particles like start coming up. And then there's all the air bubbling. Definitely not gonna sit here for 18 minutes. Um, you get the picture. So they did the air purge, eight minutes in. Looks like they're, they're pushing water through. And it starts floating over. This one's neat too, because you can actually see pretty well when it, um, when it starts becoming cleaner, the, the backwashing process is uh, a little further along towards its completion. You can see sort of the gaps where there's not quite as much junk coming out. And that simply continues for some time. They're gonna take a comparison shot here the neighboring beds that are in operation filtering water. So the water that's being added to these other filters looks pretty clean, as you might expect. And uh, this filter is coming a good bit cleaner as they go. And eventually they uh, they stop the, the backwashing, so that you can see they've sealed the, uh, I guess the exit to that trough, probably reconnected the system so that it's gonna flow um, again from the feed in and let water out through the beds rather than out through that trough. And uh, so then essentially this, is, this would be where you're starting the filter ripening process. There might be a, a little bit of sediment, a little bit of junk left in there, but it's just starting to um, head back through. And you can kind of see the particles have already started to settle. Another thing that happens when you backwash like this is if you have two different types of media in there, like a sand and a activated carbon or something like that, those two media will probably mix and it will go from like a sandy color to like a black dark color. Those will mix as it's going and then 
as it's settling back down, this is another reason for the backwash, it'll resort by density. So if the sand is slightly more dense than the activated carbon, you'll get a resorting by, by that um, method. Okay, so I guess I was right. Next time we'll, we'll do some equations to start calculating the net production. Um, for now, I want to know um, I want to know a couple questions for me, from you. And actually, um, let me edit this real quick because I, I recognize I need to give people online a little more time because um, there is like a 10 or 15 second delay. So if the question is just 20 seconds, that's not, not always enough. So I see one person online, nine people in class. Great. Okay, so I mentioned that granular filtration unit in my lab. Um, would you like to swing by there next time? Uh, true would be yes, false would be no, or don't care, whatever. Not particularly interested. So let me know what you think. All right. So we'll, I'll plan to do that next time. Um, my lab is in the engineering annex laboratory just across the way. So I should be able to just walk straight over there after this. Um, do you guys have classes you have to rush to after this? Should I set up a different time? Okay, so maybe what I'll do is I'll I'll take whoever is available like immediately after and then I'll, I'll send out an email about maybe a, another time, um, see if we can get a, a reasonable time to go over there for you guys. Um, they can't make it. Looks like probably two thirds of you can go immediately after. Okay, uh, next, would you like me sometime to rant about COVID in an intellectual manner? Or are you tired of it? <laughs> Just curious. <laughs> okay, good to know. All right, so maybe, maybe I'll give you a small rant at some point. All right, so that's it. Um, we'll see you guys next time. Have a good weekend.